I'm ready. All right. So, um, we are in Litchfield, Connecticut. Uh, we are at the site of Harriet Beecher Stowe's house. <laughs> And that is Rael doing my camera work, which I am very happy about. Um, Harry Beecher Stowe uh, was an important author for one reason. She wrote a best-selling novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which, um, you know, really gave the cause of the abolition of legalized enslavement an emotional depth that people in the 19th century could grasp. Um, and the book itself, I've read it. Uh, I've also read James Baldwin's critique of it. It's problematic, um, but I think if it wasn't problematic, it probably wouldn't have reached that audience at that time. So that's what makes this an important book. Harry Peter Stowe went on to write a lot of other books, including another book called The Byron Scandal, uh, which is an entirely different subject. <laughs> Um, however, uh, this is what makes her important. This is what makes this site important. The house itself uh, isn't here. It actually got moved across the street. Um, yeah, all the way over there, you see there's a little bit of the campus over there. I think it was even further down. Uh, you won't really see it from here, but that's fine. Uh, it got converted into, uh, you know, a number of different uses. So, uh, you know, the Historical Society in Litchfield made the determination that there wasn't enough of the house as it was when Harriet was living in it to save it. The house itself was huge. Um, you know, and the, there was Harriet, her siblings, uh, she had many siblings, um, her mom, Roxana Foote, actually uh, passed away, uh, which is tragic and normal in the early uh, 1900s. Um, sorry, early 1800s. Uh, you know, that happened to a lot of women at the time. Uh, her dad remarried um, and had even more kids. So it was a full house. Her grandmother was there. She had relatives living there. They also took boarding students um, from Tapping Reeve Law School, which is the nation's first law school. It's down the road that way. <laughs> Again, you won't be able to see it from here, but that is the general direction of it. <laughs> and Mary will show you what the traffic patterns are like, which is awesome. Um, the most important thing that I like about this song is um, it lets me talk about uh, literacy for American women, uh, which is really important. Um, Harry Peter Stowe was born in 1811, so um, the American Revolution happens. Right around the time of the Revolution, the lack of literacy among uh, women is a problem. And when I'm referring to women, I am talking about uh, women who are not enslaved. Women who are enslaved, enslaved people in general, are not included in these literacy statistics because they weren't being taught to read um, But among women who were not enslaved in New England, uh, the lack of literacy was at 38%. Um, in New Amsterdam, which eventually became New York, it was around 60%. In Virginia, I've heard that it was 70%. Uh, in the new nation at the time, it was about 50% of the non-enslaved women who didn't know how to read or write. So as a result of that, there were a lot of um, female academies that uh, got founded local level to private individuals. We're going to walk a few blocks down the road and see the site of one of those academies. Um, it's called the Pierce Academy. <laughs> and it was founded uh, by Sarah Pierce and we'll talk about more of that when we get there.
All right, so um, we are at uh, this cabin. Uh, I really hope you can hear me because I don't have a mic attached to this. We're close to the traffic. Anyway, you can look up at the sign right there. Um, site of Pierce Academy it was found in 1792 by Sarah Pierce. Um, it was for the education of girls. And again, um, literacy rates uh, were a problem. Um, the thing that solved that problem was kind of this meme uh, called Republican motherhood. Um, so after the revolution, um, you know, the idea of educating the next generation how to do that became important. And, you know, because you wouldn't have educated people to participate in free democracy. Um, that's what ensures that it remains free. Uh, so the, the uh, thought process was, well, how can we educate You know, how can we um, educate this next generation of young people, specifically sons? Um, and that task fell to the mothers. And I'm gonna plant both feet right here in 2021 after a global pandemic when I was helping my kids with distance learning. It's hard to teach your kids, um, especially my son, uh, you know, but it was fun, but it is hard. Uh, so after the revolution, again, the task of educating children, especially sons, fell to the mothers. And that concept was called Republican for the Republic, not the Republican Party, motherhood. Um, you know, so women started to demand to be educated and they started to demand education for their daughters as well as their sons. Um, Catherine Beecher went to the Pierce Academy. Oh, right over here. <laughs> Uh, she went to the Pierce Academy when it was more of a finishing school, more of like how to decorate tabletops. Um, and it became more serious and more academic when uh, both Henry Ward Beecher and uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe went to this academy. Uh, their father was a reverend. He would teach courses for free and in exchange get his kids educated here. Again, they were taking in boarders. They also had two indentured servants, which is important to keep in mind, you know, because again, this is, you know, the early 19th century in New England. There is still indentured servitude here. They are still arguing about um, legalized enslavement down the road at Tapping Reef. Um, a lot of the women from the Pierce Academy were also from outside of Litchfield. So you had people all around this town taking in boarders and the young people would kind of get to know each other and yeah, maybe they get married. Um, it was kind of that sort of vibe. Um, anyway, what is important about all this is that, uh, you know, this was part of this movement to educate, um, non-enslaved women uh, and the literacy rates went from you know as I mentioned about 50% of the women in this country uh, who were not enslaved not being able to read and write to uh, in the middle of um, the 19th century uh, about 90% of the women in this country were able to read and write right you had a 90% literacy rate and the tradition of that continues forward today. When, you know, we are talking about the importance of educating all children, when we are talking about the importance of educating all children who are immigrants, documented and undocumented, when we're talking about the importance of educating all children um, who have special needs, who may have learning disabilities, uh, you know, this is, foundational to what makes this country our country uh, and you know Republican motherhood is not the most liberating thing in the world for women it's still women are still considered mothers they still don't have you know personhood uh, in the eyes of the law after they are married 
they still don't have anywhere near the types of rights the women have today and we're, we still don't have equal rights. Um, but this is a very huge part of it. So I wanted to show this to my daughter and Mariel. Um, yay. Yay. If I can tell you. So I was talking with Mariel about this. Um, and, you know, Mariel's almost 18 years old. She's getting a little bored. Mom's like pontificating. Uh, <laughs> so um, I looked up some Mozart because why get educated? on my phone. Um, I actually have a little book of um, Mozart's thematic catalog list according to Kirchhoff. I don't know who Kirchhoff is, but at least I know how to pronounce it. Um, and in there, this is kind of interesting. All right, so uh, you can look this up. Look up um, the uh, K229. Canone, Z ist dahin, uh, for three voices. Uh, Mozart wrote this in 1782. And then you're going to see um, K230, K231, K232, um, and K233. Uh, I don't know if I should really read all of these out loud. Nah. I don't know <laughs> but they are very fun they are very interesting and They're... they are very uh <laughs> middle school level type of humor they're very yeah. lowbrow yeah um you know and mariel's probably too young to have seen the movie mozart but how mozart was portrayed in the movie mozart having a little bit of a dirty sense of humor yep that's really how he was and these yep. are real compositions that he wrote with actual factual titles um so you know with literacy... butt jokes <laughs> yes <laughs> they're butt jokes um so literacy isn't always about these boring dry things it isn't always about these grand lofty ideas like saving democracy um sometimes it's about researching historic butt jokes from yeah. one of the world's most renowned composers. Yeah. <laughs> and having a laugh about it. Yeah. You know, and that's also kind of important to do. That's kind of an important way that we can preserve history. Yeah. So again, look it up. It's a lot of fun. You'll get a laugh. And after that, check out uh, a little uh, Cicero. Um, that also makes me Caesar laugh. sticks a stab at it. <laughs> Caesar takes a stab at it. Yeah, Cicero also... How um, to make a Caesar salad, step one, lettuce, step two, <laughs> and knives. <laughs> yeah, Cicero, that, that's the title from Cicero's How to Tell a Joke. Um, Cicero also writes about how to grow old. And, you know, it kind of writes about, you know... Um, how older people can, you know, still enjoy some of the things that younger people enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> Read, look it up. History is awesome, especially when it gets into these areas that we're not going to talk about on camera, but you can research for yourself. Yeah. Because hopefully you are literate. Yeah. <laughs> awesome.